coordinator of the speaker series and we're in our fifth season if you count summer and winter of this program. Tonight we welcome legendary brothers Jean and Dadu from France. These men have shaped the direction of our ski school and ha helped define hospitality at Tao Ski Valley. Yes. but many of us have had dinner at the St. Bernard and we've had the pleasure of Jean and Dadu coming up to our table with a huge brass platter of deliciousness. There might be some talk about a ski run, a joke, and then the eyes start to sparkle, the smiles widen, and all of a sudden we know we're having the best moment of our life. And that's what I want to thank Jean and Dadu their family and their employees is creating a home for the best moments of our life. May we have a warm welcome for our presenter. Thank you for being here. Uh, it's a very short time to try and put together about 60 years at Taos Kivale. And we are going to try to move very fast so that you don't get bored, yes, but also so that you get a little bit of the history of Taos Kivale, hopefully. I came here in uh, 1958. That was my first season skiing in Taos. And at that time we had a Poma lift. A lightweight like me, the pommel lift would pick me up in the air and I would swing around and that's how I developed a fairly good balance. <laughs> At that time, we introduced the blessings of Ernie, what we called the Learn to Ski Better Week. It has had many different names over the years, but that's what we started with and that we still keep on going forth right now. It's very important, it's nothing that we invented. I brought this back from Garmisch, Germany, where I was serving with the 10th Mountain Division, head of the National Ski Patrol for the European Theater. And uh, what they did, they gave a week's vacation to the GIs, and we thought the best thing to do was to teach them to ski. And we carried that on here in Taos. We have been the first ones to introduce that, and we will probably be the last ones to keep it going. I hope so. Uh, Dadu came a couple of years later. We were wild in those times. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. And right now in our life, we have to live with the consequences. <laughs> and uh, no problem for me, but that would try very hard. You know, I don't want to start teasing. So I'm going to let Dadu talk to you a little bit about his arrival. Okay, or whenever. That's, that was a very good one. Ernie Blake and Mickey came to the airport and actually he had a station wagon. And I remember we all fit in the station wagon and uh, Ernie started driving and I was looking at the, uh, what do you call it, tachometer. Anyway, the speed limit was, I think, at about 60 at that time. And Ernie was driving at 80 and Mickey was looking everywhere, making sure that we wouldn't get caught by the police. And uh, I was looking at that and I uh, was thinking, wow, 80, that's not very fast. <laughs> I thought it was in kilometers. <laughs> and I got here in November, well, no, in August. And we started, and we started building the uh, restaurant, the uh, Saint Bernard restaurant. And uh, 
then it started snowing and uh, that's when I got my first experience with Ernie because uh, he gave me ski equipment at that time that he had in a rental shop and it was uh, hickory skis, army issues, <laughs> same with the boots because I hadn't received my equipment then. And then he took us on that pommel lift that Jean was talking about. First of all, we had to have a whole group of people before you could get on the pommel lift because you couldn't ride all by yourself, you would fly. So you waited for a group of people and you got up there. So I got to the top and we started skiing down and uh, I couldn't make a turn in those skis. So that was the first time I got fired. <laughs> I, I have to interrupt right now because the reason we had those skis is that, and I still have a pair, very white skis, it was also by the 10th Mountain Division, and I went to get them in Colorado, I was sent by Ernie at this time, but the reason we went to Colorado to get those skis is that we had no snow here. It was just around Christmas time, and as many of the years before snowmaking, we didn't know what we were going to do. So these were meant to be cross-country skis. <laughs> Obviously, Daddy didn't know anything about that. And, uh, what we did, we went to the lower part of Kachina Peak, and that's where we were controlling the skiing. We even took them with us one year to Albuquerque, because at that time, Albuquerque had more snow than we did here. Uh, I'd like for you to be aware also and let Dadu talk about that, because Dadu became the coach of the UNM ski team. And at this time, again, what happened, they didn't draft people from Norway or Sweden or Scotland or France. But what they did, they used local kids. And we had great local kids. The whole Cotton family, and still Tim Cotton, is still one of the top skiers on the mountain here. Mark Wilson, but I want that to explain. Well, there were a lot of, a lot of Taos kids that were actually part of the uh, UNM ski team. You had the Brooks family, uh, George Brooks, Larry Brooks, John Brooks. Uh, so we had them, and then we had the Cardons, and then we had the, um, the Vaux. We had, we, I mean, it, almost the whole UNM ski team was made out of the Tower Winter Sports Club kids, actually, at that time. And actually, we did quite well. They won we, the NCAA. <laughs> There was not much money at that time at UNM for the skiers. Uh, and uh, uh, we had some adventures driving to Colorado and finding places to stay way in the boondocks. And uh, George Bruce was in charge of the food and uh, it was not very good. It was not French food. <laughs> You know what, uh, at this time, we started, when I first started here, even though I was French, I spoke a little German with Ernie. So the technique that I was meant to introduce to everybody was the Austrian Vettel technique, which was introduced by a man called Krukenhauser. And uh, what we used more than anything else was a heel thrusting action of the feet with a counter rotation of the upper body. That's where it all started. Dadu got so good at it that he was able to make three turns on the top of one bomb. <laughs> but what it leads us into talking about is the evolution of technique. Because, same for him. When I first came here, I was a fast skier. I was pretty fast, pretty good, and the result showed it. But over the years, and many years it took, I slowed down. 
And I want to That's explain... That's not true. <laughs> not at all. I want to explain to you why I slow down. Because the first year, when I went to take my exam with the Professional Ski Instructors Association, they failed me. I was skiing too much like a racer. So I applied myself year after year to ski the right way, the correct way. And what I learned out of that is whenever I tried to ski the right way, the correct way, I was putting too much pressure. And I was holding myself in kind of static position. And over our past years now in Taos, we've changed that so much. And what we try to induce and introduce to the ski instructors, to the people with whom we ski, is a freedom, is an intent. If you want to go in one direction, you carry that intent of will, power to go into that direction. So if you go left, your whole body goes there. And not one part of your body is the whole of your body. It comes from the stomach, from your center, it follows through to your neck, to your shoulders. It goes with your leg, with your feet. What matters very much right now, and if I get too technical, you tell me, but what matters very much, and as you are sitting... I'm trying to spirit, fall. <laughs> He never, he never understands, but he can apply it. Yeah. With me, I can't quite do it, but I understand it. As you are sitting on your chair, very easy for you to pick up your knees. So you can do that, pick up your knees. So you pick up your knees. What you're starting now is the very movement that you need when you ski. You need this kind of action all the time, you never stop. You don't go stiff-legged, you don't position yourself one way or the other. The skis are shaped in such a way that they will draw a knot for you. And we want to take advantage of the investment put into those skis that will draw a knot. But the way skiing has changed now, you don't go so much forward anymore, you go sideways. How do you go sideways? And I want you to do it as you stand on your chair. When you lift your knees, when you do this, you turn your ankles. So you turn your ankles, then you come to the middle again, you turn your ankles. So, with the turning of your ankles, you achieve what is called an alignment. You stay aligned with the bottom of your skis. So now if you use your hands, for example, when you turn your ankles, you reach and you find an angle with your skis. And what's very important for you to know is that the first thing you want to do is find that angle. When you find the angle very early, then you don't, so to speak, change the angle. It's the pitch of the slope which changes the angle of your skis on the snow. Most people don't quite understand that. And what people do in their skiing right now, they use much more of the kind of old school type of skiing that still comes from the original heel thrust. Displacing, and you put your hand like this. It's easy, come on. Put your hand like this, and what you do now, you think you're displacing your skis, you're making a turn. So you throw your elbows to the side, like this. You're moving the tail of your skis away from your turn. You feel that? Yes. It feels so good <laughs> to most of you, but that's a wrong thing to do. However, if you have fun doing it, keep doing it. You know, if I came here for just one week, and that's all I can do, yes. But what happens, 
is that sometimes, not me right now, but we get caught skiing every day for 40, 30, 50 years. When we do that, what we have to do is try to get better all the time. And uh, skiing is a sensation activity, a sensation sport. So you want to feel these emotions. You want to feel what it is like. A beautiful turn. It was the best day today. Everybody told me the best day ever, which is nice. When you get the best day ever, you don't worry if you have to wait 40 minutes to get on the lift. It's worth it. Man, if I can get one turn, one good turn one day, man, it's totally worth it. People are a little bit spoiled now. They want more and more and, you know, what is the scary giving to me? Ah, I think we're a bit more like Kennedy. What am I giving? to the skier. <laughs> hey, you know, when I hear Sean, first of all, I know I have to practice some more. <laughs> you know, that, that getting there and what you have to realize so is that as we progress in our skiing right here, and we do a lot of studying of whatever is happening with skiing in the whole world, what happens is that we discover that in a way we have been wasting a lot of energy in our turns, and we are creating now much more by going into our turn laterally instead of, as Jean was saying, letting our ski slips away from us. The thing is that you have brand new skis that are actually are doing so much better than they ever were doing. Uh, if we had those skis at the beginning, wow. <laughs> Can't tell how good we would be now. <laughs> anyway, with those skis, what happens so is that it will have a tendency to slip away from you because it's so wide. So in a way, we do have a little bit more of a challenge because to get on to the edge and to get onto the new skis right away and on the new edge, we do have to actually commit ourselves a little bit more to the edge. But it will pay off. When you do this, you will feel much more aggressive in your turn and you won't feel that you're losing your balance. And you'll feel that you are more efficient from one direction to the other. So in reality, the reason we have been able to keep being the first ski school in the nation is because we do progress, because we are not teaching what used to be so good 20 years ago. We are continuously trying to find what would work best. Consequently, that's why people come back every year and they come back to our ski school. Actually, most ski schools now in the country are losing their students because with the new skis, it's much easier for them to ski. So they don't have any idea of the challenge and of what they could actually do on the new ski with a technique that would be applied to it. So now, being the first ski school in the country, we're going to stay the first ski school in the country because we are moving in that direction. We are completely, completely changing what what's done. And you know, we're going to stay, yes, easy to say. It takes, uh, yeah, because it, it takes willpower. You have to want to do it. You want to, to sacrifice what is comfortable to you and that you can use all the time. Uh, when I explain, I'm kind of joking, we're kind of joking to keep it relaxed, but it's very important, the emphasis that we want on the lateral movement and displacement. It's very important the idea to us that actually all good skiers now, if they turn left, their head goes in alignment with the left leg. If they turn right, it goes in alignment with the right leg. And they are always not behind it, they are ahead of it, reaching out you always reaching out. And as soon as you start a turn, 
for anyone who cares to be a little bit technical about it. When you start the term very early, as you come right in the middle of the term, before the skis come across, then you're already seeking out for the next term. And that's good at any level, be you a beginner or a most advanced skiers. And what this does, it creates some kind of a coma position. With that coma position, the word coma is used, you know, originally with the Austrian. You understand, it's a counter position. And what happens is that this is not a static position. It's a movement which is already introducing itself into the next term. And you have to believe and understand that. And if you stand up, all of you, because you need to stand up anyhow, really great, you can stand up and you can support yourself on the chair and you can start moving left or right, but as you move left with your balance, your head moves right. And as you move right, your left, I'm so sorry I asked you to do that. <laughs> I can't believe it. <laughs> Never again. Uh, I think we should go on skiing just to check the skis. Yeah, it's fun. It's great. It's good that way. Yeah. But, you know, the skis, most everybody now use white skis. They make things a little bit easier. As you get better, you try to use skis that are a little bit shaped with the quality of the terrain and the slope, so you can achieve a little bit more, but it does not have to be. The white skis, as Dad who said, they allow you to go many different places. But what you do with those skis, you work them with your toes, with your foot, you try to call them and talk them and get them to actually work for you. That's what matters. The way you feel about the equipment. That's enough about equipment right now. It's enough about skiing. Uh, in the first years, we had quite a few places to stay in Taos. We had the Innsbruck Lodge. The owner, he was pretty tough and reasonable. And uh, we had the Kandahar. We had the Thunderbird, God bless Elizabeth. You should stay in contact with her. We had the Edelweiss that Dadu put together with the help of uh, Dr. Rosen. We had the Saint Bernard that we put together with the help of Chilton Anderson. And uh, we had at one time what was the Honda Lodge. This is where I work and what I ran when I first came here. And uh, we had the Kenner Condominium yeah. also. Uh, all say, and the Saint Bernard Condo which came in the 80s. Saying that meant that we had pillows for about 600 people. But what was good about it is that all of them, most of them, participated in the Ski Week program. And then, as things changed, the cost and the price of business and people who are smart at business influence other people. They told us and they told them it's not realistic to go on vacation for one week anymore. People do not have that time. You have to create short stays. Three days, two days, longer weekends. Fine. If you try to do that, that killed many of us. Yep. And killed the ski school. Yep. We stick it out. 
And uh, Dave, I see you out there, and I know you're really listening. <laughs> because last time I made a joke about sex, you really heard it. <laughs> and, uh, <coughs> but that, that is very important. And I hope that we are still a very small place. And the kind of a small place where people should want and can come to at least spend a week. And then they create friends. And then they come back. And the instructor will be someone whom they really trust as a friend and as a guide for their joy in life and in skiing. What we are offering here is not so much something that you buy with money. We are not Disneyland, Disney World. We are not a county state fair where you buy a ticket for a ride. Granted, maybe now, you know, over the school holidays, it happens a little bit like that. But they really deserve it. But I tell you what, what really touches me when I see little kids with their ski boots on at seven in the morning, so anxious to get up. That's where it's at. It's a lifestyle in the mountain. Yeah, just one more thing that I wanted to mention is, as we're getting older, <laughs> a little bit older, we have developed a technique, again, that will help you to keep on skiing in the old age. We hope to ski in old age, and that's why everything that you will learn in a ski school is going to help you to ski longer. And we hope you are with us longer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think that we are supposed to spend some time on question and answers. And uh, of course, you can expect that from me. One of the most important questions that people want to come to us with is, hey Jean, how do you feel about Taoski Valley, the new Taoski Valley? I'm going to give a minute for Dave to leave. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> well, you know what? You're going to be so disappointed. I love the new Taoski Valley. <laughs> I like it. You know, whatever happened was needed. What has happened is behind us. We cannot change anything. We better like it all. <laughs> you know, even if I think that we lost the four line on the beginner slope where I used to train, well, too bad. I'll find another place. And there are other places. I mean, right in front of the Samburn up, those big bumps and steep terrain, that's great, I love it. It's really nice. Now, what I want to express is that, man, I make sure that all of us at the San Bernard, we love the Towski Valley, and that we, as much as we can, the new hotel. You know, I hear so many derogatory, I don't know how to say the word, but criticisms about you know, the hotel, the Blake. <coughs> you should have heard the crisis I put up with when we put up the San Bernard condo. <laughs> and the San Bernard condo, I still have to live with this. And yet they were designed by Antoine Predoc, one of the top architects in the world. But people are resistant to anything new and different. I think they made a great effort. Of course it could be better, but you know the situation with the corporation, man, you could have, you could have had a much more difficult situation to deal with in front of you. Because the management loves towels, loves the mountain, uh, Louis Bacon is great, he loves to ski. 
You know, he comes here just whenever it's really good, and he'll go for it. And the whole management, ha, huh, they're great. They love the mountain, and they love to ski, and they try their best. In trying your best, you always mistake. You make mistake. You always have to learn. Uh, I don't know, if you want a Via Ferrata, do you know what that is? Yeah, yeah. The mountain climbing thing that they have a lot in France and in Italy, and they are going to put one here. Well, you can do it, for sure, but do it in such a way where we, you don't scare the mountain, you don't scar the mountain, you don't hurt the mountain. It's a little bit like skiing. You ski with the flow. You're like a water and a river, you change, you move, you go with, you don't go against, to try to create something positive and good, okay? And I do know that the intent is what matters. And the intent of the new Tao Ski Valley is the best for the few, because they keep the same number, even though you had a long line today. God, with the snow condition, you have to make sure it's ready to be open. It's ready for you to go. Sometimes we get spoiled, and people get spoiled. When, uh, <coughs> when we rode the pommel leaf to get up, if someone fell off that pommel leaf, and they came across to snake dance, and they found snake dance, totally icy, top to bottom, and they managed somehow, willingly or maybe not, <laughs> to fall and slide all the way down, right in front of the San Bernard, and have Ernie come up and give them help. <laughs> Man, right now, I don't think we have so much to complain about. <laughs> Question and answer. Henry, you have a question? Where's Henry? Henry is right there, you can always see. <laughs> if anybody wants a reservation for dinner at the St. Bernard, yes, Henry. Uh, <laughs> ask the manager. So, Jean, Adadu. Um, can you tell us how the San Bernard and the Edelweiss um, evolved in the early days? I mean, when you first built the St. Bernard and the, the Honda Lodge was here. Well, I'm glad to tell you, because the logs that you see in the St. Bernard were taken out of snake dance. And we peeled them with our hands. And then we painted and we fixed them and things. This was all. We used as much as possible the raw materials that were available here. And one of the guys, and you'll laugh at that, that helped us at the beginning, his name is Mike Reynolds. And Mike Reynolds is the one who does the, ship, the earth ships. So we were using all raw material. It was hard to get that to work enough. <laughs> but that's all right. We also, also were right. rolling down the logs that were cut and we were using those for firewood and there always was a competition between Ernie and Jean at splitting. Who could split the logs the fastest? And at that time, let me tell you, they both were built. Not anymore, but... <laughs> <laughs> bon, Dave! Dave! Yeah. Questions? Yeah. So, how many uh, public hearings did you have to go through <laughs> to take those trees down snake pants? <laughs> None. <laughs> you know, in those times, we did none. I realize that when you ask that. We did whatever we wanted. <laughs> you know, at first, we didn't have water. 
We had a line that came to a little spring up there from the Saint Bernard. And that's how we got our water. We didn't have electricity. We had a caterpillar that was located where the first aid place is now. And that's where we made our electricity. Of course, the roads were not paved. When I first came up the road with Ernie, we had to cut trees, throw them on the road where it was muddy to be able to go through. And sometimes, while he used a lot, he really liked these, they were called snow cats, the tiny little one that we used. When I first came, I ran the Honda Lodge, beautiful lodge, it was so nice. The native from the Taos Pueblo would come and dance for us in front of the huge fireplace. Man, these are still some of my best memories. I remember also that they didn't make it one night, so we did the Indian dance. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. And That's true. I had a, I had a friend chef. <laughs> friend Yvon. chef. Yvon. His name was Yvon. <laughs> he was a great fisherman. Except that he didn't know when to stop. <laughs> and he showed all of his fish to the forest service in the game department. <laughs> that was the end of it. Uh, yeah, but he would play the drums. Yeah, and uh, what was the most popular for Tadu was a friendship dance. Because he could go and pick out all the ladies that he wanted. Jean and the dude, I have... Jean does not have a cell phone, by the way. Jean doesn't use a cell phone. For a long time, I have um, heavily admired both of your infectious enthusiasm. And as someone who would like to... Culture. Your infectious enthusiasm. For visitors and for business and house, what would your advice be? Do Friendship. You enthusiastic? Yes. Friendship. That's the most important. Honest, deliberate friendship and warmth that the people can sense it and feel it right away. I think that's what matters. We are not here for the money. We are here for the way of life, for the lifestyle. That's, yeah. that's really what matters. And uh, frankly, because that will pressures me. Uh, the seminar is not for sale. Uh, uh, the whole the whole family is involved with it more and more. They assume the responsibilities. They understand the responsibilities. And when you talk about culture, don't forget the Taos School of Music, which is the number one. He's, and the music school in the country since, I think, I hope I'm not wrong, 1963. Yes. And we are going to keep on going for all the time with it. That's our word to Chilton and uh, what his wish and his hopes were for the culture in Taos. Okay? Bike. Yeah, we did that and a lot. Slide slip that you did that went very fast. Yeah, I did actually the other race, the one from the the lift line. I mean, the house run. Yeah. That well, was, you uh, can talk about that one too. That was well. <laughs> it, it was established by a. Oh, it was it was established. I don't remember his name. Uh, 
Way in IB. Thank you. Ah, and yeah. and uh, the way it was set up is that you did three runs on, and whoever got down first at the bottom on at the end of the three runs was the winner. So they were all the bump and all the best skiers were doing it. And so the first run that we did, I was about at least 10 minutes back behind. The second run, I was about five minutes behind. The third run, I won by two minutes. Because I was so-called side slipping and I didn't hurt my knees and I didn't hurt my back. And we had the top-notch racers. We had James Herrera, we had all the... They were skiing incredibly fast. You understand what he's talking about? He was sliding, Sacrifice. in the steep lower part, absorbing all the terrain. Yeah. Just outsmarted everybody. They told me that I cheated. Well, I won. Qu'est-ce que c'est, no more? No more, okay. I don't remember any of that. I just tried, you know, I tried to do it, to it. No, but sometimes you and I, even we can have a beer. I'll have a glass of wine, glass of milk for you, and, and uh, we'll talk about some wild times. You know what? As you get older, what you expect from life changes. What you find in life changes. And uh, you start discovering something that can be very wild, but that was not about 30, 40 years ago. And I think that's the intent. That's what you try to do in every day of your life, I hope. Okay? So I'm thinking of your wild times. <laughs> wild times. You know what Daniel just told me? He, he thought he said, why it stands. He thought... <laughs> it is something we actually started showing up in the uh, five or six last year is a wider stance in your skiing. <laughs> and it really helped the ski school because people had to come back and learn about the white stance. But in reality, you know, the white stance is something that happens when you're skiing. And it happens at, uh, according to the speed at which you're skiing and according to the steepness of the hill and uh, many, many different factors will actually make you have a wider stance. But it's not really something that we decided was the new ski school move. I you, know know what? you know what this makes me think of what happened? I mean, I could start, you're gonna have to stop. But, uh, you know, we can be talking to each other for a while and we have no idea what we're talking about. <laughs> Yeah, and also when it comes to skin technique. But what it makes me think of is that, uh, for example, Elise, my woman, my lady, one day I dare tell her, when you come down, please, at the time of your turn, keep your tips up. Yeah. Well, she heard me. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> it's all a question of interpretation. <laughs> that happens all the time in our teaching. <laughs> That's why sometimes we say, watch me. <laughs> Friends have always had a reputation 
being very romantic. My question is, how many Mayes are there running around? <laughs> Mr. President, <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> That's not quite true. I mean, no, I, I'm very proud of eight children. People give me a hard time for that. But to me, that is my wealth in life. Now, Daddy will have no idea. <laughs> I have four grandchildren that I know of. <laughs> All right. One more question if we have it out there. I think, you okay, Frank? Where are those hats that you are famously photographed in? Oh, the, oh, the as astrakhan fur. I think Ernie confiscated, confiscated them. Really? Yeah. I don't know where yeah. they are. Oh, I'll look for them for you. <laughs> That's good. You know what happened? Talking about hats. Something that made me very sad because I hope that I'll be able to ski again and I look forward for sure next year to ski. But, but I don't like to wear a helmet. And that who does. But I read the latest uh, yeah, direction. You're going to have to wear a helmet. You're going to have to wear a helmet if you want to teach. So you know what I have? You will know what my answer is. When I used to race in France, I had a leather helmet. I'm going to find it. <laughs> That's where it is. Great. That's it. Thank you. Yeah, if Dave lets me. <laughs> so these guys have a dinner, as they have for many, many years now. Can we have a warm round of applause for John and Debbie? Thank you.